We're going to begin this evening with each speaker addressing the question, how does your work relate to the bioregion and what is your relation to Planet Drum? And then after everyone gets a chance to answer that question, the speakers get to ask each other questions. And then eventually you get to ask them questions too. So we don't really consider this like a formal panel. We're just friends here <laughs> chewing. So um, the first person is, uh, we can just go around. We have limited. There's mics. I think there's, yeah, we have yeah. uh, mics. Not everybody. Well, every, every other person. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. OK. Ask, ask me a question. Go ahead. That first question was, how does my work, how does my work relate to bioregion, the concept of bioregion? Um, well, first of all, I want to say my relationship with Planet Drum is over 40 years. I've been essentially a board member for over 40 years. And you, you hear the, the list of projects, the work that Planet Drum's been doing over the years. And if you knew the budget of Planet Drum, you would not believe that they're able to accomplish as much as they do. I mean, joking aside, it's remarkable how efficient and effective it is as uh, an organization over many, many years. So my work, um, since 1975, I've been consciously working in the co with the concept of bioregion. And when I became director of the San Francisco Ecology Center, it was the San Francisco Ecology Center, meaning it was addressing ec ecological issues that were the wilderness, wildlife preservation, river, you know, wild and scenic rivers, et cetera. And it was having a really tough time. And given my own personality and disposition, I thought, why don't we think of this as the San Francisco Ecology Center? And to really focus it on the ecology that was right in front of people's faces every day. And as a result of that, you know, a, a very, making a long story short, the place turned into a tremendously vital, successful place with art exhibits and different organizations. We, we said the ecology of San Francisco is street artists, it's artists, it's poets, it's the architecture, it's the, wild, the flora and fauna in the city, and really tried to draw people's attention to that so that they could, when, when you see the wires overhead, you realize that's power coming from Hetch Hetchy, or the water, where does our water come from? And it really helped people appreciate that and then relate to it and bring their own ideas to it. It was a small place, and, but I brought that same concept when I went to work at Fort Mason Center, uh, as I was the executive director there for 20 years, and never called it an ecology center, but always felt that the reason it succeeded was that it focused on the place. What was unique about the San Francisco Bay Area? The culture, the history, the, the people's interests, uh, the talents of the people in the San Francisco region, Bay Region. And the place um, turned into a tremendous success because people recognized it was like a mirror of who they were, but also a window into parts of the Bay Area culture and ecology that they were not aware of. Um, so to me, the, the way in which my work is involved, the bioregion, is focusing on the word place and how to make that place, how to, how to use that place to enhance the quality of life for people who live there, work there, or visit there. And uh, the projects I've had wound up taking on a life of their own because people felt like it was their project. And, my work became very, very easy because it was really basically opening the doors to people expressing the things that were unique in their minds and their experience to the bioregion, even though they wouldn't have used that word uh, in their lives. So that's, does that kind of answer it? Perfect. Yeah. Um, and I will mention one other thing. Uh, the final project, that I, not final project, but the, the most recent project that I worked on uh, came out of, indirectly a, a book that we did in the 80s called The Green City Project, which uh, looked at, um, we had eight panel discussions on water, energy, urban agriculture, wildlife in the city, a variety of topics like that, all of which were designed to draw a comprehensive picture of what a sustainable city would look like. And I almost had a chance to, you know, 30 years later, to do it because the group that I was involved with was gonna buy a city, a, a small town rather, in Southern Oregon, and they wanted to do this. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't come up with the money, but, but the, that, this was their 
entire focus was to create a sustainable, sustainable city. And I think that it's possible to see that happen if we kind of keep looking for the opportunities and the people who are who may have the means to help make that happen. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I, I, the only thing that I think you left out was that the way that you got people to come to the Ecology Center was by having soup lunches. Yeah. We started a vegetarian <laughs> lunch program. And because we were located on Columbus Avenue right across the street from the Transamerica Pyramid, tens of thousands of people literally would walk by every day. And we had a big storefront window and we took the burlap off the walls, put local artists' art up that was mainly focused on environmental issues, and then did a vegetarian soup kitchen and uh, had guest speakers every day talking about topics that were pertinent to San Francisco uh, and its environment. So yeah, it was a fabulous, and Fort Mason was really a bigger version of that, really. Early. Oh. I have to leave a little early just because uh, my wife made a, an appointment for us that I had forgotten about, and so I don't want to let her down. So I'll, at some point, I'll have to get up and leave, but it's not because I'm bored or uninterested. Maybe the other people in San Francisco should come first, because if I go over to Manhattan, then... Oh, yeah, we should. Why don't... Peter, why don't you go next? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we do boy, girl, boy, girl? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thanks for including me in this panel, Judy. Uh, lots of respect to you and Planet Drama Foundation and the rich history uh, of work that's represented up here by all these folks. Um, so, yeah, your question is simple. Uh, my answer could be incredibly complex, but I'll try to keep it simple. Um, so, I, as well as many people in this room, uh, and Anthony on this panel, vis-a-vis uh, -vis San Francisco, I think are poster children for the bioregional concept. Um, so I landed uh, in San Francisco initially in 1989, lived in the Castro in the summer when I was in college, and then um, permanently in 1990, and uh, went to grad school uh, down at UCLA, and I went to grad school in geography. So, and down there I was studying biogeography and cultural geography and, uh, you know, a lot of critical thinking um, about the world and our relationship to the environment. So that's really how I began thinking um, about how uh, we should interact with nature and how we should be on the earth. And then um, came back up to San Francisco and through the search for a thesis topic, uh, found what was going on at the Presidio. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with that story, uh, the Presidio was a military base for a long, long time, since 1776, um, and in 1994 it officially became part of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, our local coastal national park. Um, in 1995 the Army left, so I was there right at that moment, post a park as they called it. Um, and it was a really inspiring, incredible um, outdoor laboratory and experiential learning of like, wow, you know, how do you get to know a place where you live and work? Um, it was total immersion, and so I did an internship for an entire year. Uh, and it was during that internship where my first um, uh, relationship to Planet Drum occurred. So that was from 95 to 96, and we were working on putting together a calendar of all of the natural resource acti volunteer activities in the park, and our model was the Green City Calendar. Um, and that was in 95, 96. Uh, and then I was joking with Judy that I actually applied, and Peter Berg interviewed me for a job at Planet Drum in the spring of 1996 that I didn't get. <laughs> we don't know why, although she says she has a theory. Um, so yeah, so my relationship to Planet Drum goes way back, and I and uh, and during you know, and that was a really amazing time to be on the Presidio and to be in San Francisco and the ecological restoration movement because we're out there, we're pulling weeds, we're talking ecology, we're talking philosophy, um, and and so it's, it's all just bundled up into one mash for me in terms of uh, just becoming. Um, a devotee of the bioregional philosophy and, and living and working that um, and, and being able to continue to do that, you know, having the privilege of being part of this community and representing this community 
um, in other places uh, and and trying to, to be um, you know a leader but a, hopefully a constructive leader in this community and in, in sharing what we're all doing uh, with the rest of San Francisco and with the world and so I founded the organization Nature in the City and then uh, this opportunity this sort of pivot happened and now I work at the Department of Environment uh, which also has a relationship to Planet Drum going much further back than well not that much further back than mine actually um, so these uh, these discussions that happened in the 1980s led to this book that Mark mentioned, um, and and that uh, there was a little evolution which ultimately led to uh, advocacy for uh, figuring out how to implement this in San Francisco. Uh, and so there was a woman named uh, Beryl Magalavi who who led an effort to have discussions uh, in the 1990s around creating a sustain sustainability plan. And by the way, I happen to bring a copy of it right here. This is my copy with my name in it, so I'm not gonna, gonna give it away. This is published in 1997. Yeah, please. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, uh, actually in 1993, there, were, there was a, a, a charter amendment that created the Commission on the Environment uh, but then in 1996, there was a, a subsequent charter amendment that created a new, newly formed commission and our Department of, Envi of the Environment simultaneously, and then essentially simultaneous to the publishing of the sustainability plan, which really became the blueprint for the sustainability vision that we're now implementing. And, in, and, in, and today is in the form of this, uh, hello, where are you? Oh, sorry about that. Um, here we go. Uh, of this uh, very condensed version, it's hard to see from down there, but 08100 roots. Uh, and this is what our department and, and the other city departments um, propagate as kind of the vision of what we're implementing in terms of our climate goals, uh, climate and sustainability goals. So zero waste, 80% sustainable trips, 100% um, renewable energy, and roots kind of represents the positive things that we do to restore our natural ecosystems and, and to restore uh, our natural environment in the city and our relationship to it uh, and to make sure that everybody, all San Franciscans, have an opportunity to connect uh, with nature in the city. Not just those of us lucky few like myself, but everybody. Uh, so I'll stop there initially. I, I feel like I'm the one working maybe furthest afield, um, it depends on how you look at it, but not strictly environmental, definitely working. Um, I work for something called Maker Fair. So how many folks are familiar with Maker Fair? Oh, lots, okay. So um, it's a festival that started here in uh, San Mateo uh, in 2006 um, as a celebration of, of creativity, invention, and resourcefulness. And that, that word, that aspect of resourcefulness, I think is the, the value system that really um, connects back to um, uh, bioregionalism and that, uh, that point of view and that respect for, for nature and for resources and um, how to live efficiently um, and with purpose. Um, and uh, with in, in a thoughtful way and in a creative way. Um, and so Maker Faire is really fundamentally just a, a big show and tell. People come and, and show the projects that they, that they, the things that they make, and they share with people who come to check it out what they've learned while they were making it. So it's a big exchange of ideas. Um, and it's also um, fairly physical. I think that was part of what I enjoyed working with um, you, Judy, and the rest of the um, Green City gang around the, the focus on the um, actionable. Um, it, it becomes overwhelming a lot of times to um, become literate in the world of what is uh, occurring in terms of ecosystem health or, or, um, or the lack thereof. And I thought that the Green City Project, A, it was the first time I had, I had um, I think it was a very new idea that one could be a city dweller and, and to think of cities as actually like the virtue of density. And, and actually that, that it, it didn't all happen out in the beautiful um, 
you know, um, country that actually being a city dweller and loving and living on your loving your life and living on your bicycle and um, uh, and the the efficiencies of energy consumption and things like that about being uh, a city dweller that was a, a very new idea and that book was kind of revolutionary in in this picture and I really really appreciated the point of view um, and then you know the programs that we developed for green city project were very very practical and physical they were they were work days they were connections to other people doing work and making um, making a kind of uh, database of all of the organizations doing urban sustainability work in specifically San Francisco but the whole Bay Area available to people this is really pre-functional internet um, so you know um, it was it was it was about relationships and connection and community um, and doing and that, in some ways, is very much what we do at Maker Fair. I mean, it's a community of people that value making. Um, and and um, so it's interesting to see it. That was 25 years ago that I worked with you all. So it's uh, interesting to, to have hindsight on, in one's own life path, but also into um, the history of movements. And to the extent that, um, you know, this was a, a, a passion um, mission-based work, right, that, that a lot of us are doing. Um, Maker Fair and the Maker Movement is also, a, um, you know, passion-driven, focused uh, around, in some ways, anti-consumerist. Like, how can one be, um, uh, how can one make a difference and how can one sort of have um, agency around being physically capable and competent and, and making things, so... I don't know, that's, that's one haphazard view on the relationship between then and now. <laughs> yeah, Planet Drum, whenever Planet Drum put out a, um, an ad for a worker, an, an employee, uh, something like that, one of the aspects of the job was ability to dig a, a hole. <laughs> created this incredible program that was super dynamic and like you're saying super physical so I feel like she's being a little modest here but I just really want to speak that it was sort of this idea that Planet Drum was swirling and Sabrina came in and made this incredibly um, tight interesting program <laughs> I'm, I'm loud enough already. <laughs> um, wow, you know the Shasta, the Shasta bioregion. Here we are, um, right here in the middle of this estuary, and um, just want to share a little bit. I, I'm really enjoying this dialogue, and, and I want to make way, of course, for our out of bioregion guests. But <laughs> yeah, yes, you know, yeah. <laughs> in, in, in uh, you know, our parallel universe over there. But, you know, I'm really concerned with our bioregion right here in the Seven. Um, I'm, I'm a native Shasta bioregionist. I've been a lifelong biophiliac, lifelong bioregionist without even knowing it, okay? Um, and the concept that Judy shared earlier today around life place, okay? Life place matters, right? Bioregion, life place. But something that I do in my own daily life as, as a father, as a teacher, as an educator, as, as many others, is trying to create experiences, try to connect and network with other beings, other people, where life um, you know, doesn't matter um, at the same level that brought everyone here tonight, okay? What I mean by that, there's, there's, there's different things happening in our own local bioregion that I come from that is different from anyone here. And we're all here in all this diversity, and it's really special that we share this connection. Um, in my traditional eco ecological knowledge, it's called the kapwa. Okay, the kapwa is the shared self. And something that I admire about Planet Drum and all the allies and, and all the, the ancestors of Planet Drum movement is that it built its foundations upon high-tech knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, but something that I admire even more is 
How do you take a timeless topic like traditional ecological knowledge and make it relevant? Um, what I mean by that is, is, you know, were the stars out last night? You know, as it was mentioned today, Mr. Mark, you were saying, you know, our water coming from 150 miles away, hetch hetchy, you know, we just turn it on. These questions in the contemporary and Western model need to be asked. I, I really give a lot of credit and respect to the planet drummers, if I may call you know, um, for paving this way, for receiving uh, this traditional knowledge, but making it relevant to to you know society today and in, in life you know here in the seven by seven it's really hard as urban dwellers to really think of these concepts that we're detached from um, planet drum illuminated these 40 plus years ago um, in a way that that maybe made it more sense to us urban dwellers homo sapien urbensis you know whatever we are now 80 percent of us living in cities right um, so these concepts that are, are rooted in land-based societies, rooted in concepts of kapwa, the shared self, all life is sacred, all life is interconnected and intertwined with these natural systems. Um, what I mean by where, where life doesn't matter most is you know, neighborhoods where species are, are facing extinction. That's happening right here in our backyard in this estuary, as we know in the Shasta bioregion. Um, but it's also people of the global majority, women, immigrants. You know, we know that this is where life isn't valued in society most. And so when we talk about life place and it mattering, uh, where do we need to bring these concepts? And um, it was kind of coined after the planet drum as, as this concept also as ecological literacy, that term. You know, how to read and have a literate society which understands these ecological interconnections. Um, so where it's taking me is really looking at Planet Drum as the mycelia for groups like that I currently work with, Literacy for Environmental Justice. We're celebrating 20 years this year. And it's, it's just, yeah, let's get, you know, all right, all right, a little something. And, and it's just a point of reflection to say, what have we learned? You know, what have we done and where do we need to go? 20 years is a blink in the eye as we know on the geological time scale. You know, we, we know it's just, what is it, the last millisecond of that clock, right? Our living time right now. With that in mind, um, 20 years in this point in time it makes an immense impact. And what we're doing right here, our organization, is repairing our local ecosystems, you know, restoring habitats, but restoring ways of being, restoring people, restoring the historical and institutional trauma that has not only affected people, but the species that have inhabited this area. And that's a concept that I know Planet Drum was, was founded on, is, is protection and wellness. And I, I really like what was said earlier, the quality of life. Let's just cut to the chase. We don't need to get too edu-speaky. You know, I, we all have the right to, to live in, a, in a, a world where life is, you know, has certain qualities of it. And, and these qualities are grounded in ecological principles. Um, and those ecological principles were the original traditional ecological knowledge, that high tech. So I want to end and just say I, there's a real special personal connection to Planet Drum, uh, both of myself and, and the founders. So as Planet Drum was the mycelia, these, these four plus decades of ecological literacy, bioregionalism, and, and just living in your life place like it matters, when you think about that, um, that was the mycelium for our founder. Her name was Dana Lanzer. Many folks might know her in this room. I had the privilege of getting to work with her. And she was an understudy. She was an educator. She was a mover and shaker with Planet Drum, as Ms. Sabrina, as many folks in this panel, uh, moving and shaker in the bioregional community, and um, which helped her shape that, that vision to create an organization in an area that has the highest concentration of toxicity, the highest you know, um, hospitalization rates, the, the lowest life expectancy rates. You know, these are what I, this is the metrics of what I mean where life doesn't matter as much, okay? Because if that's going on in 2018 with all the, the boop boop you know, phones here and everything, we still have a segregated society in one of the most ecological cities in the world. I am an ambassador to rip the cover off of that, to understand that it isn't just about one way or the other, but it's about all and the interconnectedness of the Kapwa. I truly believe that bioregionist thinking 
um, honors that principle. I give credit to people like Dana who took that mentoring and coaching that Planet Drum provided so many years ago in these new concepts and turned it into a reality that is now standing 20 years later, like many of us continuing this work. And, and you know, in conclusion, I, I want to say I had the honor of working with Peter Berg in his last days, knowing that the Planet Drum beat definitely beats on strong. Till his last breath, he was keeping up the things that are most important to all life. And I think that is a model of living life to its fullest and living the life that you want to lead. And I admire folks like Peter Berg and all the folks who model this type of selfless nature because it is the shared self um, that we're working towards. So I want to thank you for just this little moment, but also just share a little bit of that energy and, and bring some of that in here that the beat goes on. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, how does uh, how does bioregionalism uh, relate to my work? Um, it's it's in my work has changed and my bioregions changed, and I'll I'll go back to some reminiscence and then forward to my work. Um, I first met uh, Peter Berg in the 70s when he and Freeman House, both diggers came to my office at a Rolling Stone publication and wanted to pull out the, uh, or wanted me to donate a centerfold to the, to the diggers. And uh, I, I couldn't get the boss to agree. And frankly, I didn't try very hard. Um, and next connection was the Frisco Bay Muscle Group. Um, which was a pioneering watershed group formed uh, to call attention to one of the zillion ever uh, resurrected schemes to divert Northern California water to Southern California around the Delta. Um, then um, when I was editing at Friends of the Earth, we published... Uh, Ray Dasman and Peter Berg's re-inhabiting um, California in Not Man Apart, which was the publication of Friends of the Earth. So we got, um, as I got a chance to be schooled in some of the foundational concepts of re-inhabitation. And as a worker in a sort of a mainstream uh, environmental group, I was really drawn to bioregionalism because the analysis went deeper and was systemic, and the vision was for a cultural change, not just to adapt industrial civilization to have it function for another century or so, but really to um, have, uh, well, one of the phrases was the idea of a future primitivism, to to move our cultures back in the direction of subsistence, which really is sustainability and equilibrium within an ecosystem. Um, but the way that that concept gets uh, expressed in bioregionalism is so rich and uh, multifarious. Um, I was, Peter and I were good friends. I, he was a mentor and, and a friend, and um, I returned to his writings. I am a writer, and uh, his work continues to influence me, and I try to carry the thinking forward. And sometimes, um, you know, his, his lengthier pieces are extraordinary works of uh, philosophy and understanding, but sometimes the aphorisms just nail a thing, like more than just saving what's left. You know, how bioregionalism was distinguished from conservation, which is extremely necessary and always will be, but the idea of not just sort of preservation and rescuing, but creating something beyond this moment that will will be sustainable and, and enjoyable. The celebratory part of bioregionalism has always been quite wonderful. The solstice celebrations and um, 
one of the things that uh, is so important or about bioregionalism, and again, this exists now by many other names, but was the sort of focus on natural history at a t and, and an affective relationship with the nature of place and the possibility, which still continues, of uh, amateurs, and the root of the word is love, you know, getting to know their bioregions in great detail and, uh, and to protect and preserve them as the San Bruno Mountain Guardian is doing and so many people who are exhibiting here. Um, so that uh, focus on natural history seemed really, really valuable and not just to, not reductive, but, but inclusive. Um, the idea of growing a life place politics is the title of one of Peter's essays and the notion that the politics of life places at various scales would sort of emerge from cultures, wouldn't just be superimposed as an off-the-shelf analysis or program, but, but that governance would come from the place and from the whole community, including the biotic community. Um, my life totally changed because of bioregional congresses. Um, this was something movement-wide that included groups other than Planet Drum, but um, in 1984, uh, bioregionalists from all over the Turtle Island gathered in the Ozarks, and it was a week-long camp out. Ocean was there doing childcare. <laughs> um, and so it was kind of like seeing things whole because there were people from everywhere, First Nations from the Southwest, musicians, gardeners, alternative energy uh, mavens, um, restorationists before the letter. There were people like uh, Thomas Berry, the esteemed cultural historian, many others. Um, and it was one of the liveliest, most meaningful gatherings I'd ever been for. And, and it was a great place to meet guys. And I met one and I moved to Michigan. <laughs> I followed him home. Um, so that's how I jumped bioregions. <laughs> and um, took the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in ornithology, there's the idea of being an accidental. You know, you're sort of blown off course by a freak wind. Well, <laughs> m my freak wind was a hippie carpenter, you know, and, and uh, thank goodness. Um, so I took my sort of bioregional education to Northwest Michigan with me and spread the word, did, did organizing, um, and still uh, try to um, extol natural history and people who love organisms, you know, uh, other, other than human organisms, not to the exclusion of humanity. And um, the, my, one, I did a book on ecological restoration because I learned about it from Freeman House and Peter Berg and others. It's called In Service of the Wild, Restoring and Re-Inhabiting Damaged Land. And the whole concept of re-inhabitation emerged from Planet Drum. So it's given me a way of, of being in the world, Planet Drum. And um, so I love the, oh, I, one thing I wanted to talk about, um, this wonderful workbook based on Peter Berg's kind of mapping exercise, uh, discovering your, your life place, is one of the most illuminating um, things I've ever done as a teacher, you know? It's like steal from the greats. I do um, use this workshop with whenever I get a chance, and it's a way of empowering people to draw their own bioregion and discover what they know about it and peel the geopolitical boundaries off and sort of see the underlying realities of place. And 
in one instance, it brought a woman to tears and a very savvy, you know, sort of Cobb construction uh, expert just because she had never been exposed to anything like this in her primary education. You know, just never been exposed to the idea of place. So an incredible tool, as so many of the publications are. And, you know, I, I can be a little pessimistic and misanthropic. My friends will tell you that. And one of the gifts of the planet drum ethos is not giving up on the human species, seeing the human species as, as integral to nature and that, uh, that we're all in this together. And uh, so moving forward uh, inclusively and, and in a, uh, in a life-affirming way with the most meaningful and diverse understanding of life. So just an immensely valuable uh, entity in the world, and and you know who's here tonight, and the work that's being done testifies to that. I'm jealous of you being able to stay because I have to leave. This is a, a great discussion. Thank you very much. Come on. Thank you, Mark. Mark. Thank you so much. Very well, Mark. Come in. Come in one. Come in. Oh, come in. Yeah. I thought you said, tell me one. I'm yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're all you're a big story. <laughs> I, I am from another estuary. I'm from New York City, the Hudson and East River estuary. So in a way, what am I doing here if you live in place? Mm -hmm. But I've had, my family has lived out here. I've come, I've known Judy and Peter for years and years. And I think there's so much to be gained from realizing that we're making the whole world look alike. Mm -hmm. And you don't know that until you travel. You get off an airplane and you can't tell. The vegetation is potted. Mm -hmm. All the architecture is the same. The smell is the same from the fumes of the planes. So this effort that we're all talking about Mark said to me when I, I just met him tonight for the first time, this is in our DNA. There's such a longing for home. There's such a longing to belong someplace. And we can't find it because cities are blanketing the natural dynamic that's there. And that's how I got started. I, from the Midwest, my parents let me run wild. And I mean wild, you know, in the woods and climbing trees and falling out and not being... In fact, I ran away at home when I was 18 months. <laughs> I have a newspaper article to prove it. But I didn't realize that that was my best friend. So when I went to New York City for graduate school, I said, well, you know, I know the Earth is here. It's got to be. And that's what I did my studies on. And I went all around the city only looking for the living earth, not potted plants, you know, with the subway underneath or the streets and the sewers, where the earth actually came into the city. Like Central Park is the living earth. Its hairstyle is not natural. <laughs> but, you know, it's like if my hat had a hole in it, the hair was sticking up. That's Central Park. So there are places, New York City has more living earth in its city limits than any city in the world. One fourth of it. I know, it's absolutely astounding. And that's how I got started. I published a book called Urban Wilderness, Nature in New York City. And then as I said, my family lived out here and then I met one of their best friends and I'm positive he was, he was my soulmate. He, he died a few years ago. He, he was from that New York City estuary and when I met him and I was working on my book, I had no idea that it was happening other places. People were saying, where's home? Where do I belong? And as a result, New York City has such a powerful place in the fight for home. The whole legal environmental movement started in the Hudson River in the 1970s, the Exxon ships that were bringing crude oil to New Jersey to be refined were cleaning out their hulls. They would 
leave the crude oil in New Jersey, go up the Hudson, clean out the boat, and fill it with Hudson River water to take back to swimming pools in the Caribbean. And a very important activist, Richard Boyle, discovered what they were doing and sued Exxon. And that's how the, the legal environmental movement started, the uh, Natural Resource Defense Council. And it was, you know, it was like a whole other dimension. We could take them to court. I think you were talking about. I mean, we are the voice for all the other living species. And this legal movement talks for mountains, talks for rivers, talks for animals, because we have to bring back the life. So I feel, I mean, what I've, I'm doing now is, is very upsetting because I teach at a university and do a lot of curriculum development. And what they're asking me, and I'm in the middle of doing, is to figure out ways to integrate into curriculums at the graduate and in undergraduate level being prepared for disasters and climate injustice, disrupting climate injustice, because the people who are being most devastated are the ones that have been pushed to the margins, and those are the ones closest to water or on hillsides that are sliding away. So uh, it's making me sick, literally, and it is so much not what I was after, because if we don't realize we are Gaia, it's not something separate. The air we breathe, you're breathing the same air I'm breathing. The, the water goes right through our bodies. The energy coming from the sun, the air, we are integral. It's not something separate. And that's what we don't understand. We think of the earth as a resource. It's our source of life. And we've cut off the arteries. So we have these, I mean, I feel like the earth is this extraordinary, powerful being, and we've cut some arteries, so it's just turning around and saying, well, well, fuck you. You know, it's just unbelievable. The hurricanes, the mudslides, the wildfires, Sandy, when it came into New York City, crashing right into people's, you know, you're not gonna let me in the front door, I'm gonna break it down. And if we don't understand that we can't intervene in something like this, we're the drunkards. We have to change our habits until we can have a habitat that is aligned with the dynamic of the earth. And whether we have enough time or not, I don't really know. But I do th believe that we could evolve with the earth, where it's going. Right? Lately, I've been working with a uh, UNESCO artist of peace. He's actually a geomancer, which means somebody who works with the meridians in the earth's body and is trying to heal them. But I really think we're at a moment when everybody has to stop what they're doing and realize that we're out of sync. There's nothing wrong with the Earth. The Earth is trying to survive, but it's very hard when children don't play in the woods like I did or on the prairie. And so how can you tell them that they're part of nature? So bioregionalism gives me a kind of legitimacy, a frame. Who wants to know what some little girl did when her parents weren't looking? Climb out the window, climb a tree, get out of there. But bioregionalism is the frame for what we need to do for climate change and for what's happening to the globalization, the making of the whole world into the same place. So Judy and Peter, thank you. Jean, could you talk about, you, you mentioned to me some things that um, uh, interactions you had with people uh, introducing bioregionalism to them? Well, the, you know, when you look, you know, you look back on your own life and you kind of say, who was that? How did we do that? But after the Exxon 
uh, re revelation. They started in the 1970s, and it wasn't until the 1980s that Richard Boyle, who was a fisherman and a sports writer, discovered what they were doing. So a group of us thought we ought to get together with our elders and honor them, the ones who were celebrating the Hudson Valley. So that was Pete Seeger and Tom Berry, who was mentioned, who was a passionist monk, actually, and had traveled the world studying religions. And he said, we have to put these religious books on the shelf. We've got to create a new, he called it a biocracy, that included all animals, all living species. So in the fall, I couldn't find out the year, but it was soon in the early 80s. We met in the Hudson River Valley at the Omega Institute off-season, a group of people interested in the survival of the Hudson Estuary to honor these Pete Seeger with his Clearwater efforts to clean up the Hudson really did turn it around. And then Richard Boyle, the fisherman, and then of course Tom Berry, the monk, to honor our elders. And somehow or other, I got the idea with a friend that we ought to write an environmental platform for New York City because there was a race, a mayoral race coming up. And we thought, well, you know, if we wrote a platform and there are all these international environmental organizations in New York City and national ones, like the Sierra Club, had their headquarters there. And then there are lots and lots of small community groups. If we had a platform, we could maybe muster enough votes to get David Dinkins, the first Afro-American uh, mayor, or he, uh, candidate, elected. So we wrote an environmental platform. This is in the late 1980s. And he won, and a lot of people in our core group, not a lot, several became commissioners. And then I got invited by Richard Register to come out to Berkeley to speak at the first international um, eco city. But there really were green cities that he was talking about. So there was always this connection back and forth. I don't know, I can't remember who else you wanted me to mention. I mean, it's just, that's, yeah. That's, that's fine. Okay. Um, Pete Seeger, by the way, was, um, when, you know, he did the, the clear water down the Hudson and worked on cleaning it up. And he actually, there was one piece from one of the early publications of Planet Drum that he really liked. It was called Nuclear Order 235, and it was an anti-nuke, um, it, was it wasn't an anti-nuke thing, it was just recognizing that if we had nuclear waste that had to be put someplace where nobody would see it for millions of years, bioregional understanding was ruined. And he, he, he came back to Planet Drum numerous times to get extra copies of that particular article. It's in the exhibit upstairs, um, if you go up there. So, um, so I think we've heard from all of the speakers. Do the speakers have questions for the other speakers? Is there anything anybody wanted to talk about? Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, Planet Drum is, is just a treasure trove of resources. And we've, we've shared a little bit of today, um, you know, literary works, uh, workshops, mentoring, what's going down in Pachamama. You know, there's just so many ways that Planet Drum is a resource. And one of the resources that um, our organization has utilized, and I would say this is almost, um, you know, broad throughout Unified School District, is the great map, Wild in the City. Um, and so my question is a little bit, if, if you know, I know, Judy, you can, you can speak on this, but if anyone's experience with Wild in the City as, as just a visual resource, who's familiar with that resource, Wild in the City map? There you go, okay. I gotta say that almost every time when I've used that map with a group of San Francisco students, I ain't talking about East Palo Alto, I'm not talking about Richmond, I'm not, you know, I'm talking about San Francisco, they're like, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And we know that was produced in the 90s, so I want to hear from folks. Uh, oh, yeah. Story. I, I was, love it. So one of the, one of the um, projects we did at Green City Project was we, um, we owned a section of Carnival Street 
fair that was on Harrison. Um, and we, we worked with different organizations we were working with to come up with not just tabling, we tried to go beyond tabling. Um, but I will say that the, 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 the map was a centerpiece of the, in, of the engagement and of the interaction with people. It's kind of one of those, um, you know, undeniable, um, it's such a beautiful illustration of, of, um, of, the, of place. And there, there's at moments of intrigue. We all have sort of ego associated with where we live, like in some ways, right? We have like self-interest. So it's kind of a, a natural, you're gonna, get, you're gonna grab people and where do I live? Where am I in this? And then where, oh, and then, and then sort of the discovery of the watershed and then, oh, the conversation about the, the landfill. And um, it just was such an, an easy way to engage people of, of all shapes, sizes, races, uh, the whole, you know, the, the, the broad gamut. It was, and I really always appreciated that, that it's like a tool, right, for, for um, communication and, and learning. I can riff on the wild in the city map all day long. I know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was leading volunteer programs for 10 years at the Presidio. And literally, in a totally, almost religious, committed way, we would start every single program rolling out the wild in the city map. Yeah. yeah. And saying, this is, what, this is what we're doing here. This is what it used to look like. This is what it looks like now. And we're restoring habitat, and in the process, we're reconnecting, we're re-inhabiting with nature where we live right here. Uh, so yeah, re-inhabitation, bioregionalism, that's been part of my lexicon and the folks that I've worked with way back in the day, including my mentor, Sharon Farrell, who was the first biologist hired uh, in San Francisco by the Park Service, uh, and many other people, um, that was the language. And uh, I wanna exploit this opportunity to also say that the wild in the city map, uh, if you remember it, uh, on one side it says 1750, kind of the ancient natural environment, right? Beautifully illustrated by Nancy Marita. And then on the right side, uh, you're facing it right now, on the right side, if you're facing it, it's this stark contrast with the 95% developed, you know, San Francisco, the second densest city uh, pretty much in North America, right? Um, and it was very authentic in that uh, Golden Gate Park almost entirely was the same color as the whole built environment, right? Because that's an artificial landscape, um, with the exception of the Coast Live Oak Woodlands, which were saved on purpose by John McLaren and William Hammond Hall before him in the planning of Golden Gate Park. But uh, we produced the Nature in the City map in 2007, inspired by the Wild in the City map, partly because we wanted to try to tell a richer story of what's happening today. So the stark contrast is striking on the wild in the city map, but don't worry, I got one of those too. But you, yeah, bring up that one. Uh, so, but hang on, I'm starting with this one. Wait, don't look at him yet, put that down. This is the one we did in 2007. Yeah, if you could hold that up. And um, so, we, uh, so we tried to just, you know, kind of illustrate with a little bit more nuance the state of the parks and the open spaces and the natural environment in San Francisco you know, in this era. So look at Golden Gate Park, right? It's not, doesn't look like the built environment. It looks like a park. And so we did this kind of three greens, you know, to kind of say, you know, there's habitat that's, that's, that exists in these planted landscapes. Well, uh, we went further with that version, and that's nice and rolled out and laminated, so we won't use my folded version this time. That's totally awesome. Thank you, Joel. Oh, you oh yeah, there it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's the wild in the city map. Yeah. yeah. Like so, and, and very authentic in terms of the native habitat that remained that's represented on the right side of the wild in the city map uh, with, the, with the, the, our old mentors, Jake Sig, Greg Gar, Mary Petrilli from the Fort Funston Nursery way back in the day. This was produced in 1992. So this is really the first kind of comprehensive ecological bioregional tool to talk about San Francisco's natural history. So a real legacy. Uh, and so then with, uh, with the 2018 version of the Nature in the City map, 10 years hence from the first, actually the second one, uh, even more nuance. And so we used, we used a lot of GIS layers to, to bring out all the different green in the city. And again, it, 
the city is not all, you know, all the green is not native habitat, but the birds and the bees and the butterflies, they fly throughout the city. And uh, while they really like the native habitat, they really like the local native plants because that's to what they're adapted and co-evolved for thousands of years, they're also able to move over to some of those non-native plants and certainly nest in the non-native trees, et cetera. And so we have the urban forest layer there that really kind of shows a richer matrix of, of nature in the city today. And, and you should look in the back of it, turn it over because it's got the other, other layers. It has other layers on the back. And I want to mention that I invited Nancy Marita to be here tonight, and she has uh, family uh, obligations that she couldn't be here, but she was um, uh, sorry you, that she couldn't. So I'm really Thank glad you. that you mentioned this. A couple of things about it that I think ev the Wild in the City map is wonderful, a wonderful um, map to show to people, to ask them where they live. Can you find where you live without reference to the streets? Pretty amazing, pretty amazing. And um, the other thing is I thought you might all probably, yeah, you have Thank a question? Oops. Can you purchase this? Yes, outside. One of the, they have, Please, they have, yeah. especially that seat map. They have this map outside, and the other map you can pur purchase from Planet Drum. Yeah, and they're um, too much to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to tell the story of how Nancy made the map. Mm. Nancy came into our office. Um, just all wide-eyed and said, I have a project. Would you like to help support my project? Mm -hmm. And the project shows she sat, Peter and I sat down with her, mm -hmm. and she said, I, I want to make a movie. I'm a filmmaker. And I want to make a movie where a little boy wakes up in the morning, and when he looks out the window, he sees the natural areas, the city peeled back. And Peter, Peter said, that's a great project. That would be a wonderful project. But why don't you start by just making a map of what the city would be like without all the buildings? And that's, that's how she got started making it. She made a version before the version, the four-color version. She made a two-color version. And then she made this four-color one. And she got lots of flack on all the maps because people disagree about yeah, what's where. Yeah. Oh, man. That makes <laughs> but, um, and the other thing I was going to say is that there's a sign up sheet for Planet Drum in the back. And there are two issues. The last two issues of a large newsletter Planet Drum did are anthology issues. They have really good articles in them. You're welcome to take them. So, um, Another question? We have to exit at 7.40, so I don't know if people have like oh. burning questions. Yeah. Audience oh. questions, yeah. Question? Yes. So Planet Drum has done a lot of projects and utilized a lot of different methods, I think. Eco-cities, community work, outreach, art making, um, environmentalism. I know Judy's made created movement pieces and, and plays and things like that. So as someone who kind of really wants to carry on this torch of environmentalism and art and community work and ecology overall and within, obviously, um, I'm wondering what methods you guys found to be the most effective and which ones felt the best. And if it's okay, men, you're beautiful, but I'd like to hear from the four women. <laughs> Well, do, do we have... Well, I mean, I'll just say quickly. <laughs> I think the thing that's so exciting about this moment is that your future isn't known. When I was growing up, you got married when you were 21, and then, I don't know, there was nothing afterwards. <laughs> there was nothing. <laughs> they didn't say anything. And just follow what you're interested in. And it's like stepping stones in a, in a mist. You take the first step, because that's you just told us what you're interested in. And then the next one suddenly becomes clear. The mist kind of slides away. And all of a sudden, it's what I call choiceless choices. 
It chooses you if you just listen. There's that in the accident. What was the ornithology? Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, being an accidental. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, cohorts are really important. Having, having friends and kindred. You know, uh, uh, Santa Cruz anthropologist Donna Haraway uh, is grappling with an issue that concerns me much, overpopulation, in some really interesting ways. She's got a slogan. She says, uh, make kin, not babies. And <laughs> the idea is to have kindred relations with other other species or uh, other, you know, sort of unrelated by kin, or by blood ties individuals, but to really, as, as we go forward in this time of uncertainty, to see that we can forge really uh, effective and, and passionate relations with all kinds of others and uh, celebrate them and, and, you know, sort of internalize their genius as well. But, but not having to go it alone is so important. And the kinds of uh, uh, just serendipities that can rise up when you get together with a group to say, hey, you know, let's do a performance piece at the block party or, you know, um, can we, well, for instance, can we get a permit to pull up some pavement and plant a native, native garden in front of our house? Um, you, you build a new kin relation that sustains you going forward. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, are you ask, asking specifically about work, like ecology work or, or a broader life question? Up to me. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. Well, <laughs> well, I think that that this is uh, there's there is a lot of um, there's a lot of disparate information, and I do agree that like finding your kin, um, looking around for what is out there, um, connecting, asking questions, never never stop asking questions. Um, there's never a dumb question. And, um, and, and those questions drive solutions and they drive progress and they drive connection. Um, and, yeah. and being aware, just opening your eyes and just noticing things. The small choices add up too. Like the big picture isn't, I think it's sort of about your mist. Like the, there is relief in the fact that if you th if you if you stay centered and make the small choices as they go, they, they kind of add up into a greater thing. So, are there other questions? Out there? Are are there questions out there? Maybe we should just move into the uh, the outside. They wanted us out of here by now. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the time? Are there any more questions? More questions? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll we'll hang out in the front. Thanks everybody.